for what it is, let's talk about you know, some ways in which it, it can be criticized. So this gives a sort of humorous criticism to this dialogue. I think you'll really appreciate this.
gave them a, gave them a concept of a music that was originally marketed towards upper class people, um, an audience that was then being disenfranchised. And it's I mean it's really a complicated concept. But if you think about sort of the history of classical music in the Western art tradition as being a genre of music originally produced for only the, only the highest class citizens, only the wealthiest citizens, that to have that classical music element brought into a genre that was originally for lower class people, we saw that from the emergence of music, of, of um, R&B and country and so forth, these points of origin being originally marketed towards lower class or lower income brackets. That to combine those two was somehow empowering to the, to the essential audience of this music in the late 60s and 70s. And again, it's, you know, it, it draws on all kinds of different things and it has relevance for all kinds of different reasons, but that's one key point that I just want to conclude with. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so while Judy gets set up, um, gets set up again, just to kind of reiterate, because now the comparison that we're going to see in relation to this potentially kind of overly complex form of music with progressive rock that seems very progressive, and that for many people at the time seemed to bear very little resemblance to anything rock at all. This complexity of the music um, is kind of moving in parallel with kind of a, a style of music that is kind of doing the exact opposite. Where progressive rock really was, as uh, Megan pointed out, kind of marketed to and made by kind of middle class, lower class, primarily kind of white male audiences. The singer-songwriter movement that's going to be kind of growing up in the UK, but mostly in the United States, is going to be kind of the photographic negative of what we had just seen with uh, progressive rock. Uh, so kind of keep the images of everything that we've been talking about with progressive rock in terms of the instrumentation, in terms of the form, in terms of the emphasis on virtuosity uh, and the instrumentalists, um, and compare those with what Gina is going to be talking to us about with singer-songwriters. Okay. Oh, it's on your toes. Yeah. All right, so the harpist of the West, which is apparently me, and I actually do play the harp, is going to be talking about the singer-songwriters of the 1970s. So can you all hear me all great? Okay, perfect. So, uh, so um, what we're going to be talking about today is this transition from all this music that we've been talking about with prog rock, um, psychedelia, um, hard rock and all of these different musical styles that are focusing on um, different instrumental timbres, thick textures, focuses on a lot of experimental sounds, to something a little bit different, where the music is pretty much focused on lyrics and the voice. Um, so I have this up here, Rock Takes a Breath. Um, so this period that we'll be talking about is about 1968 to 1975, when a lot of um, mainstream rock groups that we've been talking about, like the Beatles and the Stones, are kind of often doing a thing, a little bit disappearing from um, the rock scene. And so we end up getting this period where the singer-songwriter starts to take over and becomes really popular. So kind of what we're going to be doing is talking a lot about feelings today. So some of the factors that have contributed to the singer-songwriter movement are that this tradition is coming out of the folk scene in New York, Greenwich Village. We talked about Bob Dylan, Joan Baez, and how folk music is t becomes tied up over the 60s and connected to protest songs, anti-Vietnam, um, civil, uh, civil war, civil rights movement. Um, that's happening in the 60s, and so the singer-songwriters are kind of coming out of this tradition, but they're not going to focus so much on political issues as they are um, kind of a personal reflection of how they're feeling and how they're responding to this kind of change that is happening at the end of the 60s into the 70s, where people essentially are pretty worn down from all this kind of 
excitement, the free love, the kind of really drug culture um, that can't sustain itself for a very long. And so we end up in the 70s kind of getting this really serious um, kind of atmosphere that happens. Um, and so it's more of this reflecting on where is society going to go and what kind of issues are we dealing with right now, but through a very personal interpretation of what's going on. So it's this end of the era and this time for reflection. Carol King has this really great quote that she um, said in 2011, where she's looking back at the 1970s. So there's all this generational turbulence of the 60s, cultural turbulence, and there was a hunger amongst audiences for this intimacy, the personal thing that the singer-songwriters do. So connecting again to those emotions and those feelings. So a lot of songs that we're going to be talking about are focusing on storytelling, again connecting to kind of folk with telling of ballads, but we're going to connect and make these long um, kind of narratives of telling stories about life, autobiographical stories, so it's going to come from a very personal space. The senior songwriters are going to share their kind of what's happening in their life and connect it to you, their listeners. So there's a lot of autobiography work. Um, the sense that these songs are very authentic because they are coming out of the person that is actually writing the song is singing them. So if we